Hello and welcome to a fast interview from New Zealand uh, during this nation's uh, general election campaign. Uh, we are speaking with a number of candidates and activists during my time here, so you can all gain an understanding of the politics of New Zealand, uh, what are the big issues, and probably most relevantly, uh, what Australians can learn from this election. Today we are lucky to be joined by phone uh, by Ron Mark, who is the Deputy Leader of New Zealand First, one of the minor parties who could play a key role in deciding who forms government under New Zealand's mixed member proportionate system. The party was founded in 1993 by its present leader, Winston Peters, who uh, the New Zealand First Party has been a part of both national and Labour governments over its existence. Uh, Ron himself was a Member of Parliament from 1996 to 2008 and was Mayor of the town of uh, Carterton from 2010 to 2014 before returning to Parliament at the 2014 election. Ron, thank you for talking with the Unshackled. Not a, not a way. My, ple my pleasure. Now, some people may define New Zealand First as a populist or right-wing, or they may even say a far-right party, but how would you define the party's philosophy? Oh, I think we're very centrist. Uh, I think New Zealand First, without going into uh, the 15 fundamental principles, which you can take offline, um, we are a party that was born out of people's dissatisfaction with both major parties back in the 1990s on the back of the 1987 uh, elections, which saw some of the most uh, far-reaching economic reforms, uh, right-wing economic reforms, inflicted on this country, uh, ironically, by a Labour government at the time. Um, in that six-year period, those economic reforms, which were... We're, we're basically forced upon people without consultation, without warning, um, unsettled people's confidence. And I think that was only reinforced when the people voted that Labour government out, voted in a national government who had opposed most of those economic reforms, only to find that that government too actually picked up those economic forms gleefully and uh, put them on steroids and rammed them even further down people's throats. And I think on the back of that, uh, those two terms of Labour, two terms of national government, um, people came to the conclusion that the national and Labour were pretty much the same, that they were losing economic control, uh, the control of their own uh, economy, losing economic sovereignty. Democracy was just a, a byline word for an election purpose only. And uh, out of that, people from the left and the right um, came together and formed uh, the centrist party that is called New Zealand First. Um, the name which they selected pretty much espoused their, their views and their philosophies of the time, that being that in all things, a government should put the interests of the people first and particularly of New Zealanders first. And uh, it's a party that blends the conservatism, um, uh, a no-nonsense approach to, to issues, an honest approach with a strong social conscience, which I think probably is where the old National Party views did reside once upon a time. So I think um, we're a very much a centre party. If you look at our economic policy, if you look at our work for the Dole policies, if you look at our law and order policies, then look at our, our superannuation policies and the views we have around uh, providing for the most vulnerable, being elderly and children, it truly is a blend of left and right, um, but with a heavy dose of conservative common sense. So we're centrist, very much. So obviously that's how the party was born out of the 1980s and early 90s, but moving into the, the modern day, what do you think the major parties are ignoring? And do you still think that the New Zealand political system is somewhat broken? Well, I think the New Zealand system is, uh, political system is still evolving. Um, we adopted uh, the, the public gave um, politicians, MMP, as its way of ensuring there was some moderation and that no one party could ever dominate again uh, and have absolute control uh, on their own. Um, I think we've still got some way to go with that. I think we, whilst we have an MMP election, 
my observations from five terms in Parliament and, and uh, you know, two terms outside of Parliament looking back at it is that the House is still run on first-past-the-post lines and principles and there's still a high degree of collusion, quiet, off-the-record, backroom collusion between National and Labour on matters that affect the way in which the House is controlled, which guarantees and assures them that regardless of uh, which one of them is in power at the time, they will always have a leverage and an advantage over alternate parties. So in that, in that, that, from that perspective, I think we still have some way to go. Um, maybe if that doesn't get rectified, the public might inflict a further blow on our house and bring it, give it STV, uh, which would actually destroy the two major parties, I think. Deb, what issues do you think the major parties are ignoring? Yeah, I think they, they are deliberately ignoring the fact that New Zealanders um, are over the uncontrolled immigration policy of Labour and National. The only reason Labour's now saying things like, oh, it too aims to reduce immigration is because of an election. It's not what they believe in. They believe in quite the opposite. In fact, they've done very well in their time in government opening up the door to plane loads of new immigrants has endeared them to those immigrant communities whom they've used as an ATM for their party funds. Um, so we don't buy their newfound uh, belief that immigration is too high and it needs, the immigration numbers is too, are too high and need to be reduced. We believe that's a politically expedient line for them to run during an election. Uh, the, the control over the economy, the fact that we went too far to the right with our economic reforms, that the Reserve Bank Act needs amendment. Um, these are things that New Zealand First has campaigned on for 24 years, coming up 25 years, and only one of the parties is now starting to indi indicate that they would look to address the RBA. They certainly don't give us credit for it. But I think it, the, the touchstone issues for us that um, they don't like talking about because their track records are not good in national or labour, are foreign investment, sale of land to foreigners, foreign uh, investor control of the New Zealand economy, the influence that um, investors, corporate or foreign, are having on government from the shadows. These are the issues they don't want to talk about, and uh, and I'm very pleased that the leader of New Zealand First, uh, Winston Peters, in the last brochure that he's just put out nationwide, has reminded people of those matters uh, because that they are the they are the things that are really annoying a lot of New Zealanders deep down. And you can have debates and arguments about health, you can have debates and arguments about education, student you know, uh, tertiary education, whether it's free, whether it's part funded, whether it's not. Uh, but when you get down to immigration numbers, when you get down to foreign investment, sale of land to foreigners, sale of New Zealand companies to foreigners, moving of companies offshore to mainland China, no, those are touchstone issues that have really got people uh, angry and they have had enough. And one of your other policies is you're a big supporter of uh, direct democracy or uh, binding citizen-initiated referenda. Do you think that the politicians will, uh, like they did with uh, MMP, will eventually come to support that? Well, I don't think they'll get any choice about it because I think we have a, a new... Um, <clears throat> th there's a new voter out there. They're not so... Not so new. They've been around for at least 10 years or five years, but there are voters out there now and new voters becoming eligible to vote who are tech savvy and who, who, who know intuitively that referenda could be done so easily, so swiftly, and that they could directly have a say and actually that they want to have a say. Um, the, the old argument that all oh, organising a referendum is expensive and it's time consuming and da 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 won't cut uh, any ice for the you know in, in the near future. I think we've consistently said that you know on the question of euthanasia it's not for 120 uh, individuals in New Zealand to make that such a far reaching uh, uh, decision a decision that stretches, you know, that, that, that 
Travis's issues of religion, personal conscience, uh, the question, the question of the differing views of the, uh, the differing generations, um, that's a question that should rightfully be put to all New Zealanders and democratic uh, and and to express their views democratically, and that could then be enacted upon by the rest of the country as having been a democratic decision made by the people of New Zealand. I think uh, technology has given us the ability uh, to to address these matters um, quick, quite quickly. And uh, politicians who really sit there in their deck chair on the on the edge of the uh, yeah, on the beach, you know, waving at the waves like some King Canute saying no referendum, no referendum. Well, they're just going to get swamped and drowned one day, and that'll be drowned by the weight of public opinion. And and I think you know, rightly so. And do you see New Zealand First as part of the uh, growing anti-globalist, anti-establishment uh, movement sweeping the world? I mean, Winston uh, Peters, your leader, is often referred to uh, in the in the foreign media as a Trump-style figure. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that that's a very fair or accurate um, uh, description of of Winston, but. Um, because he's been around in politics a hell of a lot longer than Donald Trump. Let's be <laughs> clear about that one. But um, it's quite strange they don't describe Trump as a Winston-like person, but that's probably because he's not. Um, I think uh, New Zealand First has never been afraid in its 24 years of calling a spade a spade and saying things that people are thinking um, because they need to be said. We aren't intimidated by the politically correct or the social engineers who would label you to shut you up, whose who's prime tactic, if they can't win a debate or if they don't like the debate because they don't want to have the debate, is to uh, label you and stigmatise you, demonise you, marginalise you and shut you down and shut you up. Uh, New Zealand First has you know, been weathering... Uh, labels of racists and xenophobes because of our view on population management and population control for 24 years to the point now we just laugh at some of these idiots. And um, and I think that's, that's all they deserve. If people cannot have a sane, sensible, rational conversation about that question, how many people do we think New Zealand can take per year? What is our target population, what skills are we short of, which countries have open, have credible uh, education systems with highly um, you know, regarded uh, qualifications that withstand checks of probity and legitimacy. If you can't have those sorts of conversations, if you ignore and turn Nelson's eye to the fact that we've got a whole bunch of Indian uh, agents sending the people over here who are not actually students, they are people seeking residency and using our, our export education sector as a me- mechanism to get in. If we continue to ignore the number of people who China wants to ext- extradite out of New Zealand who were given residency here and who subsequently we learn are wanted by Chinese officials uh, who've gotten through our immigration system because they had a lot of money in the bank. Funny, funny, how the heck did that ever happen? Where'd they get the money from? If we continue to ignore these things, then we're just a stupid, stupid nation. And we deserve everything that comes our way. And and, our, and sadly, that's what has happened. And New Zealand First will not resile from those debates. And so if we get labelled and we want to call us, call us Trumps or Trumpet, you know, whatever, I don't care. You know, the old saying, sticks and stones will break my bones, but names will never hurt me, rings in my ears right now. <laughs> That's certainly a good attitude to have. Now, in this election, uh, New Zealand First has often been described as the, the kingmaker about who will become Prime Minister. Uh, why, why do you believe that uh, New Zealand First has the ability to work, but work with both major parties and uh, get some of their, their policies implemented? Well, I think um, history shows that we have been able to do deals on the left and on the right. Um, we we did a coalition agreement in 1996 with National. We did a coalition agreement in 2005 with Labor. 
Um, one worked out uh, very well. That was the one with Labor, um, and it, it survived the full term. And we got some good policies put through, like the Super Gold Card for the elderly, uh, just to name one. Um, and under National, sadly, um, if it hadn't have been for the ambitions of Jenny Shipley, who deposed her leader Jim Bolger, that government would have survived right to the end, and would have gone down, I think, in history as one of the one of the better governments because we had a raft of policies negotiated in that deal. Um, sadly, you know, um, you, you know, nothing. You, the peaceful ambition of an individual is something you can't factor into a coalition agreement, and uh, that one tipped over upside down. But we still did get a lot of good things through in those two years that we were there. Um, you know, the free health care for children under six uh, was one of those uh, uh, hallmark policies for New Zealand First. So I think history, in answer to the question, his, history shows we're capable of working both sides. We didn't break the coalition with National. National broke their deal with us. Um, if it hadn't been for some New Zealand First MPs who were attracted to the retaining their baubles of office uh, and split away to support Jenny Shipley, National's Jenny Shipley, and her bid to be Prime Minister, uh, we would have seen that through. So I think for both National and Labour, um, their core voters like our policies. There's there's a side of Labour that would prefer to work with New Zealand First and the Greens. We know that. They talk to us all the time. Um, and there's a side of National that would far prefer to deal with New Zealand First than deal with the Act Party or the Maori Party. So it is a bit of a two-way street. You do have national elements and Labour elements wanting to work with New Zealand First and New Zealand First is open to those conversations but of course we will always uh, look to have key policies of ours implemented and it really does come down to who's prepared to you know, to accept that um, and to work with us on those issues and I can, you know, Winston's outlined a number of bottom lines already um, and, you know, re-entry of Pike River being one and um, and taking race-based legislation off the table and out of the RMA is something else. So it really will come down to which of those parties uh, is prepared to have a, uh, a, a serious conversation with New Zealand First about New Zealand First policy. Now, my final question is, uh, some people describe New Zealand First as a cult of personality around Winston Peters, but are you confident that the party has a long-term future when uh, Winston Peters uh, retires? Well, look, I think um, we're, we're in a rather unique position to all other political parties in New Zealand in that um, <clears throat> we still have our founding leader leading the party. Um, a man who uh, I often describe in my military way as being the hardest, uh, the heaviest piece of heaviest hitting piece of artillery in the house, and and it's astonishing that no matter how many uh, new young bright things that pop up, they simply don't have the institutional knowledge, the political history, um, to to argue the current policies against what we've seen from the past and. So in that respect, um, the day that Winston decides that he's going to hand on to another person uh, is the day that some people are probably um, not too keen to see because he does a brilliant job there and he is our founding leader. But, you know, we spent a lot of time, and back in 1996, I worked hard to get the party to agree to a youth division being established, and the party refused, and... Uh, in those days, I had an ally by the name of Deborah Morris, who was the youngest New Zealand youngest person to ever become a minister in a New Zealand government, uh, was an NZ First MP working with me. We tried desperately to get a young New Zealand First branch and running. We were unsuccessful then, but in the last few years, we've seen the emergence and the establishment, uh, formal establishment in the constitution of a young New Zealand First uh, division, uh, electorate, and my crikey, they have gone from strength to strength. I'm so proud of what they have done. And they fill me with total confidence that we have a new batch of people coming through who are thoroughly versed and believe in the New Zealand First philosophy and our policies who played a strong part already in helping to reshape some of our policies um, and who have played a very strong part in running campaigns around the country in support of the leader and the party in general. I don't think we've ever been in such a strong position 
looking at the number of new candidates that have stood this year, uh, looking at the wealth of young blood coming through, men and women, looking at the, even those candidates in their 30s and 40s who are now there, looking at the new MPs that uh, I've had the privilege of uh, being a deputy leader for, mentoring, coaching and guiding over the last three years and how they've progressed. I couldn't be more confident that the movement is now a fully-fledged movement and the day that the founding leader decides that he uh, wishes to hand over, that we will carry on and, uh, and uh, we'll probably step forward in a slightly different way, depending on who's leading. Whoever that person is going to have one hell of a hard act to follow. So I don't see anyone putting their hands up too quickly around here right now. Let me assure you that, because I'll forever be compared with the greatest politician that New Zealand has known in the last 40 years. And uh, that's going to be a pretty heavy log to carry around on your shoulder. Well, Ron, it's only a few days to go until polling day, so I appreciate you taking the time out to, to talk the, unshackle, the Unshackled and, and good luck for the, the final days of the campaign. It's certainly going to be an interesting result. Oh, thank you very much, mate. And I think uh, the boss said on TV last night in an interview, he has no idea where this is going. And I think the wonderful thing about this election is the public themselves are keeping the politicians guessing. And that I find absolutely delightful. So... We will uh, await the decision of the people. We will accept the decision of the people. And once we know what, hands, what, what hand it is they've dealt us, then we'll play that hand to the best of the ability that we can for them. And, uh, yeah, thank you very much for having me on board. I really appreciate it. This has been an Unshackled Fast. Please like, comment and subscribe. While you're here, grab our free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and visit theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.